Good evening and welcome to our Signpost Programme webinar. Uh, this event has been uh, organised by Chagas and Borbia as part of the Signpost Programme. My name is Tom O'Dwyer, uh, I'm head of the Signpost Programme and I'm the host for this evening's webinar. Greenhouse gas emissions, and more correctly, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, from, uh, from um, Irish agriculture, has been prominent in the news this week, as leaked details have emerged of the proposed reduction, sectoral emissions reductions target um, for agriculture. And viewers may have seen reports of a requirement for agriculture to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by between 21 and 30% uh, by 2030. Now, while the webinar this evening is not going to directly deal with the proposed targets, it is nonetheless timely that we are hosting uh, this evening's webinar. After all, the old adage, what you measure, you manage, uh, is very true. And with 54,000 dairy and beef farmers uh, receiving uh, their um, farmer feedback report from Board BIA, and this report containing a carbon footprint figure uh, we believe that farmers are well placed with at least the measurement part of that old adage. So 54,000 farmers have a carbon footprint and they can look at that and examine um, and use it to uh, inform themselves as to how their form, farm is performing in terms of um, emissions. And admittedly, while it's not an overall farm admissions figure, it is a useful starting point for farmers to begin to, to understand the level of emissions from their farm. Ultimately, farmers will have to reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions. That's what the leaked announcements of earlier this week mean. But we believe that they can begin to move in the right direction by focusing on the carbon footprint figure uh, supplied by Borbia following their farm sustainability audit. I hope by the end of this webinar that you will understand your carbon footprint figure, that you can use the additional information contained in the farmer feedback report to make more informed decisions about your farming activities into the future, and that these decisions will in turn lead to reduced emissions. And so to introduce our three panelists this evening, uh, they're all on screen at the moment. Uh, I'm joined by Eleanor Murphy of uh, Board BIA, she my colleague Seamus Carney from Chagas, and also a County Cork dairy farmer, Jack Carney. And uh, talking to Jack and Seamus before, they, they uh, told me that they, there was no relation, although the same surname. Um, just a brief overview of what each of our panelists will discuss. Eleanor will uh, 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 present uh, her presentation first, and she will emphasize the importance of the sustainability survey in providing an accurate carbon footprint for the farmer. And will also take us through uh, the Board BIA Farmer Feedback Report. Uh, Eleanor then will be followed by Seamus, and Seamus will list and explain the mitigation actions, the practical actions, and Seamus is very strong on this, they're the practical actions that farmers can take to reduce emissions on their farm. And finally, I'll be joined by Jack Kearney, and, and Jack and I will discuss how Jack is taking on those technologies on his farm and what differences they've made over the past couple of years. Uh, before handing over to Eleanor, I'd just like to remind you that should you have any questions for any of our three panelists, please add them to the chat function on Zoom. Uh, my colleague Siobhan Kavanagh, who's also on screen at the moment, is on question duty tonight, uh, and she will uh, gather the questions and then put a number of the questions to our, to our panelists uh, before the end of the webinar. Uh, all in all, we are scheduling the webinar to last for one hour. So we'll be wrapping this up at, at, um, in, in one hour's time. So uh, I'm now going to call on our first panelist, Eleanor Murphy, uh, to begin her presentation. So Eleanor, if you'd uh, share your presentation and um, the floor is all yours. Oh. Eleanor, yes. Okay, uh, thanks Tom very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Eleanor Murphy. I'm the Sustainability Data and Analytics Manager in Board BIA on the Origin Green and Quality Assurance team. So this evening, I'm just going to talk to you about the sustainability survey that's filled in as part of um, the, the membership to the, the SBLAS, the Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme, and the SDAS, the Sustainable Dairy Assurance Scheme. Um, and then I'm going to explain how the data that's collected in the sustainability survey influences the carbon footprint that's calculated for your herd and also how you can access and interpret the farmer feedback report that's sent back to our members after being certified to our scheme. 
So just to give a brief introduction to the, the schemes themselves, so the, the Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme in its current structure was introduced in 2014 or 15, I think. And since then, we've completed um, about 240,000 carbon footprints for our members. And we have uh, somewhere between 51 and 52,000 members, depending on, I guess, the time of year we get members um, joining so they can get the be, meet the conditions for the quality assurance bonus for, for meat processors. And for the dairy scheme, we have about 16,000 members in our dairy scheme. And to date, we've completed 70,000 dairy footprint assessments for our members. Uh, the models that we have for the beef scheme and the dairy scheme are called life cycle assessment models. Um, and essentially what that means is that we count all of the emissions coming from the farm itself, which is typically made up of the animals and um, how the activities on the farm are completed and also the off farm emissions. So off farm means anything that's imported into the farm for the function of the farm. So what we mean by that is the, the fertilizer that's bought for the farm or the feed that's important, whether it's concentrate feed or, or forages or milk replacer um, and, and the associated emissions that come from the production of those inputs. To give a, a brief description on how we collect data from our members for the scheme and where that data sits, um, for the completion of the carbon footprint report, we require uh, four data sources, I suppose, um, depending on whether you're in the beef scheme or the dairy scheme. So for the beef and dairy scheme, we access the animal and in identification and movements database. This allows us to complete an inventory of the animals that are, that are on the farm each year. We access the sustainability survey data that's in recorded by the farmers themselves. For the dairy scheme, the milk co-ops supply the, the milk supply data from, from each of the, their suppliers and members of the, the dairy scheme. And for the beef scheme, we get an average daily live weight gain figure for herds um, from ICBF. All of this information is stored and held in the board BS systems for each of our members, for each of their audits. The data is then used into the inputs of the model. The model completes carbon footprint calculations and the outputs are then stored back into the, the board BS systems. Um, Chagask are the, the research agency that provide the, the carbon footprint models themselves. There's a separate carbon footprint model for dairy and a separate carbon footprint model for, uh, for beef. And I suppose um, talking to farmers today, Really, the sustainability survey is where your input is, is very valuable and very important to complete the calculation itself and to ensure that the information that we feed back to you, the members of the schemes, are is as accurate as it can be to, to assist you to, to make more informed decisions. So, uh, next slide. Next. Yes, OK. So just to cover some of the details of the sustainability survey and help create, I guess, a better understanding of the information that's asked and why it's asked and how that can influence the emissions that um, are calculated in the carbon footprint. So when you fill out the turnout and housing dates and the grazing information for your animals, this informs us of the um, the emissions or the, the model sort of tracks the emissions, should we say, for when you have a housing period, there's manure that needs to be stored so we can calculate emissions from the storage of manure. When your animals are grazing um, throughout the, the spring and summer and into the autumn, we can track the manure and urine related uh, emissions from the animals grazing themselves and we can also calculate the grazing season length for your herd. Uh, the feed information, so this is the concentrates that are being fed to your cattle, whether they're indoor or outdoors. This um, is used in the, the calculation of the, the emissions coming from the feed themselves, so that's very much dependent on the, the ingredients of the feed, and we ask if, if the feed has soy in it or not. So if it has soy in it, that's associated with higher emissions due to land use change emissions coming from the production of soy in South America. It also tracks the animal digestion related emissions of the feed itself and also can influence your grass fed status um, of your herd. 
the fertilizer records, then we, we can track the, the emissions coming from the fertilizer that's being produced, the actual production itself, and then the fertilizer related emissions from the application of that fertilizer onto the ground. So, you know, whether it's a can based fertilizer or a urea based fertilizer, they both have different emission factors that would influence your final number. And the N, P and K content of that will, will ultimately influence the N or the, the emission factor of that as well. And finally, uh, the last part there on the fertilizer is lime use is associated with CO2 losses. But you know, as lime is very important for your soil pH and, and soil fertility. So it's a valuable input into the, into the system. The last section there, you're looking at manure related emissions. So as I said on the first part, you know, we, we know that you have to um, house manure, but we also know you have to apply manure to the land. So the, the type of information that we ask and record uh, allows this, the model to calculate the emissions coming from how and when the manure is applied. So whether it's applied in the springtime, this would be associated with different emissions in the summertime. Um, how it's applied, whether it's a splash plate or a low slurry uh, spreading technology. And then finally, you've got the AIMS information. So this allows us to, you know, derive the, the energy demand and therefore the digestion demand. And that's based on the age, the breed and the sex of the animals. So the dairy carbon footprint is, um, is calculated then. We, or the carbon footprint is calculated. We sum up the emissions coming from these areas of input and we divide it by the area of the output of the farm. So for the members of our dairy scheme, that output is the dairy carbon footprint, and that's measured in kgs of CO2 equivalent per kg of fat and protein corrected milk, which is a standardized, um, a standardized unit of milk in kgs. And also for the beef carbon footprint, that's, uh, that's recorded as kgs of CO2 equivalent per kg of live weight gain. So that's the, the weight that's put on by your animals in the year that the, the assessment is being completed. Um, there's just some notes there. I suppose the sustainability survey is used in the carbon footprint, the grass fed standard and the farmer feedback report. It's collected at each audit. And, um, and additionally, the information that we collect is required for the previous production year. So if you complete an audit in 2021, um, the carbon footprint that's reported back to you is it for 2020, so the, the sustainability survey should be filled in with data from 2020. So having the carbon footprint allows us to report back to you, the members of our schemes, um, the, the, the carbon footprint of your enterprise and I suppose how the, the data that's collected in the sustainability survey influences your carbon footprint. So we display the carbon footprint of the enterprise along with the breakdown of the carbon footprint of different farm activities. Um, once a, a beef farmer or a dairy farmer become a member of our schemes, it's posted to our members, but farmers can also access it online via the Boardbia Farm portal at farm.boardbia.ie. And I have a couple of slides um, that goes through how to access that. Before, before that, I'll just talk about the farmer feedback report in a bit more detail. So as I said, the farmer feedback report, you know, essentially we're using all of the information that I've just touched on and the, the model output to display back to the farmer the sustainability efficiency of the system that they're running. So the way it's laid out is we, we display, let's say, the carbon footprint as an example. And the carbon footprint of your most recent audit is compared to the carbon footprint of your previous audit. And then it's also compared to farms of a similar size or a similar system type. And that structure is repeated for each of the different areas for the greenhouse gas emissions, for nutrient management, which covers manure and fertilizer use for your grassland management, the grass fed criteria. And then finally, there's a, a health and safety aspect um, about the which is more closely aligned to the, the scheme criteria. So if I just uh, give an example of what a typical dairy carbon footprint um, farmer feedback report would look like. So as I mentioned, the carbon footprint for dairy is kgs of CO2 per kg of fat and protein corrected milk. In this example, the farm or it shows that the current assessments carbon footprint for the farm, which is 1.11. 
Um, it's gone down 16% since its previous assessment. And when it's compared to farms of a similar size, so between 125 and 150 dairy cow farm, the carbon footprint is 1.15. So the, 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 this example, the farm carbon footprint or the dairy carbon footprint is lower than the average. So it's a, it's a, a performing well. And underneath that, then the farmer will see the breakdown of the emissions coming from the different areas of activity, similar to a, the, the slide above where we're looking at animal digestion, uh, the proportion of emissions coming from animal digestion, the proportion of emissions coming from manure, fertilizer use, forage and feed and other, which is, is general farm, farm emissions. And, and the next slide then shows a similar a similar layout, but it's more specific to a beef carbon footprint. So a beef carbon footprint is displayed as kg of CO2 per kg of live weight gain. In this example, we're looking at a suckler to weanling store farm. So the carbon footprint for the most recent audit was 11.75. It's decreased 5% since its previous audit and compared to farms of a similar size. Um, the average carbon footprint for these types of systems are is 13.28. So this farm is performing quite well. Um, if I just show you the next slide, it, it just kind of breaks down how the the how I guess the actions that farmers can take to reduce their emissions from those different types of activities. So ultimately for beef systems and dairy systems, you know, animal digestion will always be a very large component of that due to the the enteric fermentation of the, the food or the feed in the animal's gut, the feed and the grass. So for, for beef, I suppose, more specifically, looking at reducing your finishing age or increasing your daily live weight gain figure would help reduce these types of emissions, improving the, the utilization and grass quality of your, of your, of your pasture and looking at things like um, herd health and breeding and her herd health plans would make sure that the animals you have are, I suppose, are fertile, are, are healthy, are, are, are growing well and reaching that finishing age at, at a younger age. For manure related emissions, you know, the type uh, of feed. Ellen, oh, yeah. sorry, just maybe you might move on because I'm conscious there's questions coming in and we want to leave time for, oh, okay. for question and discussion. So, yeah. Okay, sure. I'll I've just um, what I'll do is I'll actually go to the how to access it online. You know, I just want to cover that. So if you do want to, to see your farmer feedback report, um, you can log on to farm.boardbia.ie. You will require your herd number and your pin number, which should have been given to you at your most recent audit. But there's also a forgot pin function there if you need to request a new pin. If you have a, a smartphone, you can you can scan the QR code there and that will bring you straight into the, the logon page. And just to cover the, the, the forgot pin function, essentially you just have to put in your herd number and it'll prompt you to confirm your, your, your mobile phone number. Um, there's a, a, you know, I am not a robot and you select yes and it'll send you a text message with your pin on the, the, on the, on file. Um, so just, you know, we will be working on, on updates to the models, integrating our systems with ICBF, introducing country specific emission factors and recalculating historic, uh, we have, we're, we're launching an update tomorrow for our dairy audit. So we, we will see an average dairy carbon footprint for the RSDAS members go from 1.14 down to one kg of CO2, um, per kg of milk. And we'll be launching or we'll be starting our beef update next month. So if, if, if I have time to take for questions, I'll do that there. Um, so Tom, okay. Yeah, no, no th thank you very much, Eleanor. And, and sorry for, or rushing you just a little bit there, but I, I know I want to bring in Seamus and Jack and then we'll have questions. And before you go, there are two questions in the chat that I would like to put to you just at the moment. Okay. Uh, first, first is in relation to a sheep carbon footprint. <clears throat> I think earlier in your presentation, you mentioned a dairy and a beef carbon footprint, but not sheep. And the question is, why is there not a sheep one? And I, I suppose I'll just add a supplementary, are there plans to introduce a sheep carbon footprint report? Uh Yes and yes. Um, the we did actually we will be launching a, a lamb carbon footprint next year, and we've started collecting data for that already. And so once we have a year's worth of data, we'll start generating a feedback reports for lamb as well. Okay, and the second one then that comes that's related to your presentation. What about a, um, a farm a, da uh, a dairy farmer? I think it said 
who's a mixture of dairy and beef. So it's got a dairy enterprise and a beef enterprise. You, you've referred to both reports in your presentation, but, but yeah. what's the reality when you've got this mixed farm? Yeah, so obviously it's very common for, for farms to have a mixed enterprise, especially dairy, I suppose. So um, for the start of the farmer feedback rollout, whichever enterprise is has the, I suppose, the highest level of activity. So if most of your activity is from your dairy enterprise, um, we send a farmer feedback report that's related to your dairy enterprise. We do calculate a beef and a dairy carbon footprint for for your 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 dairy enterprise and your your kind of beef or cattle enterprise, but um, we don't have an ability at the moment to do an entire farm carbon footprint. But with the updates that I did touch on there, we'll be looking to move towards an integrated carbon footprint report for for beef and dairy. Um, the problem is, I suppose, with carbon footprints, you need a common unit. And typically for, for milk, it's kgs of milk and for beef, it's kgs of milk. So you'd need something common or kgs of beef, sorry. So you need something common between them and, you know, trying to come up with a, a balanced approach for that is tricky. But um, so at the moment, whichever is the largest of your, your system types, you'll get a, a carbon footprint for that. But if you're you're curious, you know, do contact us and, and we can let you know what the, the carbon footprint of your, your other enterprises as well. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, that's uh, great and uh, um, very clear answers to the questions. So I'm now going to call on my colleague, uh, Seamus Carney, who is uh, part of the Signpost program team. And I suppose um, Seamus is going to follow uh, Eleanor's presentation and is going to move towards the, the practical actions that farmers can um, adopt, can practice on their farms, that will lead to a lower carbon footprint. And I guess Seamus will be referring during his presentation to the fact that these actions have been, uh, I suppose, uh, discovered through research um, and they're, they're now being used on farms. So over to you, Seamus. Thanks very much, Tom. So look, as, as Thomas said, it's looking at the practical actions uh, from what Eleanor has said there, the carbon footprint. How can we reduce the footprint? What actions can be put into place on your farm? So what I want to briefly look at is just the mission breakdown by enterprise, whether it's dairy or, or, or dry stock, the building blocks to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions on your farm and to quantify the farm actions and their reduction potential. And we're going to finish up, Eleanor was working on a, on a cattle uh, case study there. So we're going to finish up with a dairy case study and what kind of uh, actions uh, percentage can we get at the end of it all. So looking briefly at a dairy carbon footprint, uh, I think this is one Eleanor used. Uh, we can see here that 65% of the emissions are related to the actual animal themselves. Uh, we take fertilizer, um, feed, and uh, diesel and energy usage is coming to about 35% overall. So to put in the context of a target emission reduction of 20 to 30% by 2030, we will be reducing our uh, total uh, inputs onto the farm by 60 to 70% without looking at efficiencies of stock. Now, if we look at a suckler beef carbon footprint, again, this is a suckler farm with whaling to store cattle. Um, the percentage related to the animals is actually higher again. So 58% of the emissions is coming from animal digestion and 31% come from manure, storage, spreading and grazing. So if we're looking then at the inputs on that farm, they're giving a emission factor of about 11% overall. So even on that dry stock farm, cutting all the feed fertilizer and all the energy usage is going to give an 11% reduction on overall carbon and sorry, farm emissions. Uh, so we have to look at trying to finish the stock earlier, move stock on, better animal performance uh, in order to hit our 20 to 30% target. So what are the building blocks to, re to reduce emissions at farm level? So it's first of all, it's starting with the foundation and it's looking at biodiversity and water quality, uh, two big aspects about environmental sustainability. It's about managing hedgerows, trees, high nature value, uh, carbon sequestration on the farm and it's about managing and maintaining water quality and improving water quality through adhering to buffer zones not spreading slurry uh, keeping out at least five meters of many open drain and that when fertilizer is being sprayed or slurry that it's at the right time right rate and and, and, and uh, the right application once we have those cornerstones in place it's all about getting the lime the p and the k uh, so ph uh, phosphorus and potassium and also getting the proper animal. So from a dairy point of view, a good fertile animal with good EBI, very productive animal. From a suckler point of view, 
an animal with good paternal replacement index, uh, good stars in the animal, where it leads to an animal then that's more productive and more efficient. But earlier finishing the cattle and having a good animal health plan on place at the farm. And so as we got, once we got the four foundation stones in place, we can then look at fertilizer, its type, timing and quantity. We can look at the use of slurry storage, the timing of when slurry goes out and the application, how we spread it. We then look at grassland management, grass quality and grass measuring. And when all those are in place, then we look at clover, mixed species swords to try and reduce our overall fertilizer usage at farm level. But bearing in mind, sustainability is about environmental, social, and, uh, and, and profitability. So it's all about farm profitability uh, to generate a farm profit and to sustain the farmer at the center of everything. So how do these follow through? Looking at animal productivity in relation to the EBI or the Economic Breeding Index from a dairy point of view, for every 10 euro increase in the herd on a yearly basis, it will generate an extra 20 euro profit per cow per year. But at the same time, it has a knock-on effect of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 1%. And how does that happen? It happens through a, a, a more productive herd where the herd matures higher milk solids per cow and leading to a lower replacement rate of some place in the region of 18, 20% rather than 25%. So it's all about producing the same output with less animals. So less replacement followers and possibly in some cases where extra production is got per cow, maybe few extra less cows in some cases. And it's the very same principle with cattle improving the maternal replacement index. So it's improved health and survival shorter calving interval, more calves per cow per year. Grassland management, when we look at grassland management, uh, whatever enterprise you're on, every extra week spent at grass can reduce greenhouse gas emissions on your farm by 1%. When we look at quality of grass, grazing good quality grass, 13, 1400 covers for the summer months versus strong grass at 2000 kilos per matter per hectare, it can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 15% per day. And when we, when we look at it over a, a period of eight, six to eight weeks over the, the main summer grazing season, uh, that can have a knock on effect of reducing the overall emissions at farm level by one to two percent. When we look at meal feeding, uh, reducing meal by 50 to 100 kilos per cow can have a knock on effect of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by one percent. In relation to silage quality, uh, the higher the dry, DMD of silage, uh, the lower the fiber content that lowers methane produced by the animal, which also lowers the greenhouse gas emissions. So better quality silage will give lower greenhouse gas emissions. When we look at fertilizer, protected urea, it's urea that's actually coated with an, an inhibitor. So basically what it, it, it's as cheap or cheaper than can. So the inhibitor, what it does is, it means we'll, the protected urea will, will work the same as urea at the shoulder of the deer in damp conditions, and it will work the very same as can during the summer grazing season. And I suppose we look at protected urea, protected urea is really agriculture's answer to electric car. It's, 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 it's a different version of the same product, to give the same end result. And it's a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions of can. So a lot more environmentally friendly form of fertilizer. And when we run it through case studies and we looked at shifting to 100% protected urea and dairy farms, spraying 200 to 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, we were seeing reductions of seven to eight percent reduction in greenhouse gases. Now, if we do the same thing on bee farms with a lot less fertilizer being used on bee farms, it could give a reduction of someplace between 2 and 4% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Once we had the type of fertilizer chosen, we didn't move on to how much fertilizer we use. And by running through some of the, the case studies, um, the model in Moore Park with, with Lauren Shalou and Jonathan Hearn, we found that by reducing fertilizer by 25%, it can have a knock on effect of reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions by 5% overall. Again, when we superimpose this onto beef type scenarios, that has a knock on effect of reducing emissions by one or two percent. And I suppose I must say as well that th these were run through the life cycle assessment model uh, in Moore Park and Chagas is the same model that's used for the, the, the carbon footprint, which Eleanor has been talking about, which was developed by uh, our colleagues in Chagas and Moore Park. And when we look at fertilizer reductions, how do we get fertilizer reductions? By getting the lime, the P and the K right. So by having lime at 6.5. P at index three, K at index three, it can release up to 80 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. So it's, it's natural nitrogen coming from the ground by getting the line, the P and the K right. When we look at clover, clover from work by James Humphreys in, in Solohead, clover, when it's incorporated, when everything else is right inside fertility, can replace up to 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. 
And it's the same principle with the mixed species swords, with like the chicory and plantain. There's also clovers in there with perennial ryegrass. Um, so it's given the same production per animal, but it's helping to reduce the amount of chemical nitrogen used at bar. And when we look at slurry spreading, it's all about the timing. If we look at, uh, at, at using slurry in the summertime with a splash plate, um, we're looking at about three units uh, per thousand gallons for the summer. But if we go earlier in the year, we can add another three units per thousand gallons for the slurry. And if we didn't go low emission slurry spreading, we can add another three units per thousand gallons on top of that again. The spreading with low emission slurry spreading in the springtime can give up to nine units per thousand gallons from your slurry at two and a half thousand gallons per acre. That's giving 20, 23 units of nitrogen to replace fertilizer for the first application in the springtime. So what kind of potential does this give it at farm level? So if we look at the farm sustainability leaf here, the seven stages of the farm sustainability, where we're looking at EBI, extending the grazing season. So when we look at those here, if we can extend the grazing season by one extra week, we can get a reduction of 1% on our greenhouse gas emissions. Better quality grass in the summer can give us another 1% reduction. And by getting the two of these right, we might be able to reduce some meal here. So by reducing the meal by 100 kilos, we're also getting another 1% reduction in overall emissions. When we go on to the EBI, there's nine years left to 2030. So if we can increase the EBI at 10 euro per year for nine years, so that's 90 of an increase in EBI, that gives a knock-on effect of reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions by 9% by having less replacement animals and more productive cows on the farm. When we look at re 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 replacing, uh, using clover to substitute for, for fertilizer, uh, again, 25% reduction in nitrogen, 5% reduction at farm level. And by using changing to protect the urea, another 7% reduction. Uh, the low emission story spreading give a 2% reduction. And on energy levels at farm, it's the simplest in the region of 5 to 8%. So if we can reduce the energy, like solar, solar panels or something along those lines on, 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 on a dairy farm, it could give a reduction of, of 1 to 2%. So if we add all these together, it comes to 27%. But there is a crossover effect on some of the different items uh, if we're using less fertilizer, we won't get 7% for like the urea because we're going to be using less fertilizer in the first place. So this gives a range of a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of someplace between 23 and 27% at farm level. And to look at it, I suppose what's achievable for 2022. So the, the grassland management, the better quality grass, uh, and that's cutting a 0.3 of a kilo per day back into cows then for the rest of the year. Protected urea is a phone call if you go about it early enough. Uh, and the low emission slurry spreading, a lot of dairy farmers are at that now since 2018. So straight away, the quick wins can bring us up to 10, 15% reduction in emissions straight away. So in summary, lower greenhouse gas emissions are compatible with good farming. And it's all about getting the basics right. So it's soil fertility, herd fertility, uh, animal health and, and, and performance. So healthy animals perform better. It's about having good grassland management. And I suppose the one big message from our, 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 our uh, online uh, webinar tonight is, first of all, I would, I would suggest to any farmer to go after the quick wins, first of all. So the likes of protected urea, low emission slurry spreading, or what I would consider environmentally friendly slurry spreading, and grassland management. They have the potential to give 10 to 12% uh, gain very quickly at farm level. And I suppose the one thing with the targets have been set for us as an industry, and it's the one thing we, we, we are very low in a global situation for our carbon footprint. And farmers are fantastic to adopt technology when they can see where it has a place in their own farm. So the sooner we adapt technology, the, the, the more achievable the overall targets would be for agriculture as an industry. So to summarize, a, a, a good start is half the work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Seamus. Um, and um, that's a very um, clear presentation. I'm just going to uh, select maybe two questions uh, from the, um, the chat. Um, the first is in relation maybe to the easy wins. And I, 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 I kind of was thinking of asking you that question. I think you kind of summarized it there in the end. But are, are there certain technologies that, that really farmers sh should be going for first and, and, and pick off the low-hanging fruit? Absolutely, Tom. And it's coming back. I don't know. Can you see that slide? Have I helped the screen there at the minute? It's it's no. it's very much about um it's very much about protected urea, low emission slurry spreading, improving the grassland management, and uh, extending the grazing season. They're, they're the technologies first of all. There's ten or twelve percent of a win there very quickly on a lot of dairy farms. On a dry stock farm, it might be someplace closer to maybe 
uh, five to ten percent those mm. big wins first of all but de- okay. definitely the low hanging fruit time to go after okay and the, se- the second one um and I'm, I'm maybe going to paraphrase it just a little bit but um can you maybe compare what you've spoken about reducing the carbon footprint and the overall emissions reduction target that's been leaked of 21 to 30 percent so in other words, if farmers focus on adopting the technologies that, that you've spoken about and reducing the footprint, can that also contribute to reducing the um, overall emissions from agriculture? Yeah, um, very much so, Tom. And, and, and Jack, you will see in Jack's present uh, in a minute that Jack's numbers are very stable. So if stock numbers are staying the same and the emissions come down per kilo of milk and you're producing the same amount of kilos of milk, your overall farm emissions come down with it. Uh, the issue is where you're reducing the intensity of kilo of milk produced, which you keep increasing by more kilos of milk, then that has a tendency to increase the overall emissions at farm level. And the challenge presented to us all as an industry is to reduce the overall emissions. Mm. So for, uh, farmers are pretty much gone as far as they can go, uh, where they reduce the, uh, car- the carbon intensity of the product they're producing, they will also reduce the overall farm emissions as well. Okay. All right. Look, we'll we'll bring Jack in at this stage. Um, uh, so, Jack, maybe you join the conversation if you turn on your camera. So, uh, the format we're going to take with the next part of the webinar is that I, I'm just going to have a camera there, Tom. For some reason. Okay. I'm going to have a conversation with Jack. <laughs> so, if I can, are you hearing me, Jack? I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can't see you though. No, my, it won't let me turn on my camera there. Okay, so maybe our tech. Oh, wait, now you're you're here twice, Jack. Are yeah, you... I'm the one with my mic off there. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll look. We'll 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 go ahead and um, perhaps uh, maybe um, our, our technician in the background might be able to help you sort it out. So, okay, um, Jack, you're very welcome. Um, okay, um, uh, so you're very welcome. Um, I was actually on your farm last week. You, you held a farm walk last week, so it's been a busy week for you. Uh, perhaps for our viewers on the webinar um, this evening, you would just firstly um, tell us a little bit about, about your farm, um, maybe uh, where you're farming and the number of cows being milked, that sort of thing. Yeah, so farming here in Red Karma in County Cork, um, milking 160 cows with my mother and father. And um, the whole farm is about 90 hectares, a uh, good bit of that is leased away from the milking platform of 46 hectares, so we're um, stocked at about three and a half cows a hectare at home, but overall about 2.2, so um, okay. that's kind okay. of what we're at, spring calving system. Spring calving, okay. So I, I'm going to maybe go down through a couple of the, the technologies that Seamus has mentioned in the, in the previous presentation and just kind of tease them out a little bit with you. Um, and I suppose, look, in, in no particular order, but Seamus did mention that protected urea is kind of a, an easy win. I understand from talking to you that you're using protected urea. When did you start using protected urea? Um, in 2018, I suppose, I joined the Food to Farm program there. And um, I kind of, where well, we kind of decided that we kind of start using it then. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose the first year we probably dabbled with it a bit just to see, did it actually work? And we kind of found out fairly quickly that it didn't really make any difference to Ken so um, it was slightly cheaper so we said we'd, we'd go for it um, and the following year then we kind of went basically full protected urea except for compounds um, okay. compound fertilizer apparently well, any compound fertilizer with P we, we, we would um, use just but otherwise not it's, it's, it's all protected urea. Okay so it sounds like you've had a good experience, you'd, you'd hardly increase your usage of it and replace other nitrogen fertilizers with protected urea unless you were satisfied. Yeah, no, um, very satisfied with it really, like to, to be fair, or the amount of nitrogen we have been using has actually kind of fallen back a bit over the last couple of years. So that's kind of what we like to see. So, um, mm. and we mm. still seem to be able to maintain the amount of grass we're growing to support okay. so. Okay. And I noticed on the, in the chat, Jack, that there's a number of comments and questions coming in about the availability of protected urea. Um, have you had any such difficulties in sourcing protected urea? Um, no, I haven't. Um, if, I suppose the, the longest wait you might have to have is maybe a week, but I suppose, look, we'd probably buy a, a good lash at the time anyway. So we'd probably try to be as prepared as we can, but uh, mm. as a rule, a week maybe it'd be the most okay. way for sure. okay and and you're you're kind of planning ahead and, and and placing a bulk order i guess is yeah. what i'm hearing 
Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to move on then to another area that Seamus mentioned, which is the whole area of soil fertility. Um, and again, having been on your farm last week and, and listening, listening to you talk about this, I know that you've, you've made a big effort to correct soil pH, uh, improve soil phosphorus and soil potash levels. So where is the farm at currently in terms of pH, P and K levels? Um, overall, um, the fed, I suppose optimum is only at about 37%, but uh, uh, lime, um, P and K, I suppose they're they're all up in the the um, the eighty percent level, but I suppose of optimum of index three or above. But as it, at home is is good, but um, I suppose um, the silage ground, it's rented ground, some of that is new ground, and it would be quite low. So mm. that's I suppose that's probably where um, we're lacking a small bit. So we have made an effort to try and um, um, basically bring up those indexes by mm. using p buildup and. And as basically, we've made an effort to bring slurry to the size ground as well. Okay. Um, it seems to be hopefully this year now with soil sampling again this year, we'll, we'll find out that it's doing the job. Okay. So you, you've made an extra effort to move the slurry to parts of the farm that are that are low for uh, potash, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So okay. I suppose just trying to make full use of the slurry if we can at all. Yeah. Okay. And as you mentioned slurry then, um, I noticed on your farm last week that there was a, a, low, a low emission slurry spreader, um, a, a dribble bar, I think. So uh, have you purchased that or? Yeah, that we bought that you? two years ago um, hmm. and have been trying to make full, well, ever since the day it arrived into the yard, there hasn't been a splash plate used. Um, okay. I find it a great job at trailing shoe. Um, it's definitely, you would see the response a little bit quicker and you can go back into grazing it a bit quicker as well. So um, I'm delighted with that now, to be fair, that okay. purchase, it seems to be. And has, has it allowed you to reduce your bagged nitrogen fertilizer applied? Oh, definitely. Like, to be fair, um, I think that's the biggest thing, is, it, the biggest advantage of it. Like, you know, um, I suppose whenever I do go at slurry in the spring now, it said the first round especially, I, I would skip completely what um, I spread there. I might, might give the first round maybe two and a half thousand gallons of slurry where I can um, mm. in early slurry, and I wouldn't that wouldn't get any fertilizer then. Um, mm. And then where for the rest of the year, then I would follow suit. And, and I suppose would cut back on the bag wherever I, um, wherever I do spread soil water or slurry, I would cut back, you know. And mm. it's working, like to be fair, it's it's working a treat for us. And like you do see the reduction in the fertilizer building after that, like you know. Okay, so there's a there's a cost benefit in, in terms of a reduced spend on fertilizer. Yeah, like just say for instance, there now, like um this year we spread about 220 kgs of nitrogen, but about two years ago that was up to 250, like you know. So okay. it is it is a, a, a it's a big reduction and it seems to be See. Okay, so Seamus, Seamus is just after putting a slide up on screen there, um, just to show how your um, carbon footprint has changed and, and what has contributed to those changes over time. So that, that's that's just there on the screen now. I, I was just going to maybe mention one other thing because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that there's a lot of questions on the chat. So I, I was just going to ask you maybe one or two other questions and then move to the, the discussion part. Uh, one other thing that, that struck me as, as quite uh, significant and important, I think, to your farming system was the amount of slurry storage available on your farm, Jack. And, and, and you and, and I think your advisor, maybe Mary Flynn, um, commented on this at the farm walk last week. Um, what, what level of slurry storage do you have on the farm? And, and how do you feel that this additional slurry storage is helping you in, in terms of farming more sustainably? Yeah, so I suppose um, two years ago there, we built a, a new, basically, cubic unit. We got Thames in it. And we said, look, we'll, we'll um, put in enough slurry storage while, while we're at it, because I suppose, I suppose this, we thought the day would come where we would need more of it. And, and I suppose, look, it, it probably is coming. So we have enough storage now for um, basically to keep all our side water and slurry for 18 weeks. And um, I suppose we're using that now to, to basically all our side water dilutes our slurry to try and make full use of the slurry to get as much basically as much nitrogen out of it as we can. And it, it, it like it does um it takes the pressure off there on the spring there as well if you're the, the tanks are never full really to be honest. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay and look my 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 final question to you is is around clover. I, I know you're you know you're starting um maybe on a journey around clover um and you you kind of admitted it as much I think last week at the farm walk. 
what, what how, how have you made that start jack what, you know what, what are you trying out on your farm in relation to clover specifically well i suppose um like our decision to go at clover was more of a financial decision we want to try and get more basically grow as much grass or if not a little bit more grass and less nitrogen and maybe get more mixed others out in clover mm. right? so it's just purely a financial decision more than anything okay. else but um i suppose we, we, myself and Richie O'Brien and Marie decided that we'd try a paddock there this year and we, we just said we'd half the, 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 basically half the amount of fertilizer we were putting on from May on and um, basically just see how it goes, try and encourage clover to grow and like it's after growing, that specific field is after growing um, 12 ton, half ton more than the rest of the farm on 180, uh, 180 kg of nitrogen, which is, which is um, 40 less than the rest of the farm. So like okay. that's, that's um, a promising start to the whole journey okay. in clover. And I suppose we're going to try and um, maybe incorporate a bit more clover into the, into the pasture over the next couple of years. But like, it's not going to happen overnight. So yeah. it's going mm -hmm. to have to be a, a gradual process. And, and look, we'll, we'll have to learn a bit more about it along the way to see how to manage it, but we'll, we'll figure it out, all right. Okay, all right. Okay, look, I'm at th thank you for taking those questions. Um, I know that there's uh, a lot of questions on the chat, not, not necessarily for you, Jack, but, but for all the panelists. So if I ask Seamus and Eleanor to rejoin us, um, I apologize for the, the technical difficulty that Jack is having with, with, with his phone. It, it was working um, when we did a... Saying the whole... Uh, 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 the, the, the check, the technical check uh, before, before the kickoff at half seven, but... Um, technology seems to have let us down. So um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Siobhan. Siobhan, you've been looking at the questions. Um, there's, there's a large number of them there. So I'm going to ask you to put the questions to the panelists. I'd, I'd ask you maybe to indicate which panelists you want to answer the question. Yeah. I'd also ask as well that the panelists keep their answers brief because we have about uh, 15 minutes uh, to the end of the webinar. There's a lot of questions. So if you keep your answers brief, we'll, we'll get through a good number of questions. So over to you, Siobhan. Okay, thanks, Tom. Yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in and we'll try to get through as many as we can. I suppose, Jack, to start off with you, there's a few questions coming in specifically around protected urea. So how does Jack manage the shelf life of protected urea, the short shelf life of protected urea? Um, we'd buy, um, we'd probably buy enough for two rounds at a time. Um, that's generally what we buy. Um, uh, I suppose, look, plans change, so we probably don't buy too much of it. But, like, I haven't run into a problem with it yet. Um, any bag of rice spread seems to grow. We're, we're measuring grass quite consistently here, so I, don't, I haven't seen it, a dip in growth any time I've spread it yet. So, like, it seems, to be, it seems to be doing fine. I haven't run into a problem. I did carry a few bags over the winter there. Um, I had a bit left over there uh, last, or the year before last, and, and I spread it in the spring, and there was no issue, so... It's still urea at the end of the day, you know. Okay. And any issues around using protected urea early in the season? No, no issues at all. It's the same thing, really. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, there's another question in for Jack. How do you achieve, and I suppose this maybe is directed at Seamus and Jack together, because Seamus, you've done the case study here, but how does Jack go beyond where what he's achieving or what, what's set out in the plan at the moment, like with that leaked um, target between 21 and, and 30? If Jack has to go to 30% reduction, where does the extra come from? Do you want to come in there, Jack? You don't mean to take it? Um, yeah, I'll let you take that in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, and I, I suppose that's the one thing, like the, the, the MAC or the marginal abatement cost curve is giving about kind of 15% reduction overall. So there's going to be future research. So it's going to be research into like trying to reduce methane uh, in, in animals. So it could be feed additives would be part of the solution. Um, beyond that, it's probably incorporating more clover and trying to reduce the... Um, the total number, sorry, the total amount of fertilizer being used in farm. And also in Jack's case, his cows are very fertile. Uh, it's probably maybe reducing the replacement rate coming through and, and even Jack's herd mature. Uh, but it's going to be a challenge. The first 15% is going to be that bit easier. The next 15% after that is going to be a lot more challenging. Okay. okay, Eleanor, there's a lot of questions in for you on the, the carbon footprint. Um, a question that's come through a lot is, is carbon sequestered by soil, hedgerows and forestry included in the carbon footprint? Okay, uh, short answer is no, not at this point in time. Uh, Chagas have started research um, and I guess we're about four years away from, from getting a, a method that would allow us to capture the, the sequestration that's going on at, at field and farm level and allowing farmers, you know, to get the credit that, that, they, that they deserve for that sequestration. So, 
Okay, all right, that's clear. Um, my cabin footprint looks very high. How can I get it checked? That question is coming in quite often. People maybe not 100% happy with the figure that they have, and can they get it checked? Uh, yeah, okay. So I suppose um, the help desk that Board BIA have uh, that operates, um, they're trained to, to look at the figures um, and to correct, you know, um, some figures if, if that's the problem. So my advice would be to, to check the farmer feedback report and to see if there's anything in there that looks incorrect from maybe the fertilizer point of view. Sometimes we, we do have to correct that. So if you, if you do want it to be corrected, you can call the the help desk. Um, I don't have the number on me at the moment, but I'll send it after. We can send it out thing. tomorrow. Yeah, and um, they can they can change they can update the 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 sustainability survey related data and rerun the the footprint for you. Um, but I suppose that would go back to you know making sure that that farmers take the time and and to be accurate at the time of the the audit to to fill in the sustainability survey. But yeah, it's uh, they can correct it. Yeah. Yeah, but that the accuracy of that. Sustainability survey is really key to making sure that your figure is right. Yeah, exactly. From the from the get go, yeah. Okay. At the moment, I'm getting my footprint every eighteen months after an audit. Is it likely that that will come more regularly to me to help me to use it as a, a tool for making planning decisions? Yeah, great question. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we do hope to open up the sustainability survey for all our members at the start of each new year. Uh, which would allow us to calculate a, a newer carbon footprint or an annual carbon footprint for our members each year rather than getting one every 18 months. So um, the, the benefit for that is uh, the reporting is more frequent, so you get an annual carbon footprint. But the other benefit is if farmers fill in the, 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 the new sustainability survey early on in 2022, let's say, the data that's required from 2021 will be fresher in their memories and the records will be more available to them to fill it in accurately at that time as well. So there's a dual benefit to that, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the moment, there's no target figure on the farmer feedback report. Are we likely to see a target figure there in the future? Um, I suppose the, the Chagas Dairy Roadmap has a, a dairy target, I think, for 0.73. So I guess the, the thing that we're conscious of in the farmer feedback report is the space across the page and the length and not making it too long, but it's certainly something we could consider or including um, something like the top 10%, which would be a good, a good kind of uh, benchmark to aim towards for, for producers as well. Okay. And another question, I suppose, is similar to that is, are we likely to see the total emissions figure for a farm on the farmer feedback report? Yeah, we've we've gotten this a couple of times. I suppose the when we've considered it, the the sense is that the you know I suppose the average emissions for something like a dairy herd could be five hundred thousand kgs of CO two. Now, a quick way for a farmer to actually calculate that is to multiply um, your carbon footprint by the output. So for dairy, it would be multiplied by the litres of milk or for beef, multiplied by the kgs of beef produced. Um, and that would give uh, the farmer an idea of the total emissions from the farm. Um, we are considering including greenhouse gas emissions per hectare in a, the next iteration of the farmer feedback report, which would um, not give you total emissions, but it'll give you a sense of, you know, how efficient your land is being as well. All right, very good. Um, a question here on soy and accounting for, for ingredients and rations. So the footprint takes account of soy and rations. Does it take into account maize or imported wheat and barley, for example? Many, many feed merchants now are doing the Irish ration op option, and how is that taken into account? Yeah, that's a, a fair question. I suppose um, when the sustainability survey was launched, we had to be very considerate of how much time we would take up. So we use assumed ration mixes and the, the barley and wheat in the ration mixes in the footprint models are considered Irish. And uh, if a farmer selects that soy is incorporated into their feed mix, then we, we add in the soy then as a as a, an additional emission. So, I mean, we we're we would like to link up with with merchants, whether that's fertilizer merchants or feed merchants to get a better sense of, of the feed mixes that are being sold to farmers. But that's a, a, a would like to have in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. 
Um, there's a question here about the inputs, the concentrated inputs being done on a monthly basis. Just to explain, Eleanor, why they're done on a monthly basis yeah. rather than just a total figure at the end of the year. Yeah, so the monthly, the, the way the model bil is built is it works on a monthly basis. So, you know, I mentioned we've got the AIMS data. So each month we count up how many dairy cows you have and how many dairy cows might be milking, how much milk is produced per month. And so we need the, the, the concentrate figures per month to divvy out the, the, em the emissions for the concentrate use and feeding for those each month and it also influences um i suppose your grass-fed figure for that month as well okay um moving on to seamus now a few questions for you seamus is carbon footprint likely to be the new key performance a key performance indicator for for farmers for all farmers dairy and beef farmers yeah well i suppose the, the total emissions like we have to hit a figure of something between 20 and 20 and 30 percent reduction in emissions so at least knowing what your emissions are at farm level it's about getting yourself informed, first of all, what your emissions are, then taking action to try and reduce them. And as Ellen was saying, then if you're doing your yearly update, then at least you're keeping track of where your overall emissions are. So it will be a key indicator how much stock can be kept in farms long term. So it probably will be a more important indicator as, as time goes on. Okay. Seamus, a question here for you on any research done on grass species that are not as nitrogen hungry as perennial ryegrass. Yeah, um, to answer that one, I'm not aware at the minute, uh, but there is research being done on... Um, you say the, the grass clover swords versus grass swords versus uh, mixed species swords and how, how the amount of nitrogen needed to grow the same amount of overall annual, annual tonnage. Uh, but again, we're in a very early space with a lot of this, this work with the environment and, and methane calculations. So that's ongoing research that will feed into the models as time goes on. Okay, there's a question here on ploughing and contributing to carbon footprint. I don't, I don't know if anybody is on the panel is is to take that one on. Seamus, do you want to comment on that or? Yeah, if, if anyone was make a comment, uh, basically uh, it's it's the inputs that are looked at rather than the receding. Uh, obviously, if you're doing more receding, how that's going to feed through, I'd say, in the carbon footprint is you'll be using more uh, P's and K's and nitrogen fertilizer to get the, the crop established, first of all, because plowing does release some uh, carbon into the, the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, Tom, I, I might ask you to comment on this because I know we had a conversation about it earlier in the day, but there's a lot of questions coming in about the availability of protected urea. Not that a farmer is saying, yeah, I'm committed to using protected urea. I want to use it. I see the value of it from, from um, um, an emissions point of view and, 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 and playing my part in reducing emissions. But the availability is an issue. Do you want to just comment on that, maybe? Yeah, well, look, I, I, I put the question to, Jack, to Jack and, you know, Jack's, Jack's response, I guess, was that he's planning ahead. Um, he's, I, um, I suppose he's putting together an order that's of, um, you know, a reasonable size and an attractive size to the, to the supplier and, and he's managing to secure supplies. Um, so I'm, I'm assured that it's, it's, it's not a problem on the, on the manufacturing side. Um, so... Yes, it, it is frustrating if you've made the decision to, um, to, to convert to protected urea and, and you go to your retailer and the retailer can't supply it. I'd ask if you've approached your retailer in time, um, you know, if you're seeking an adequate sized order that, that makes it attractive for the retailer maybe to place that order, um, that you're prepared to wait a little time for it. You know, that if it's not in the yard, you'll say, well, look, can you get it for me? I can wait a week. You know, I don't need to spend, spread it today. I'm planning ahead. Um, so, you know, there's, there's things like that and the manufacturers re reassure us that if, you know, if, if there's demand for it, they'll have it. So, yeah, that's all I can say on that. Okay. All right. It, it just it is, it is coming up quite a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has the panel any comments on slurry additives and their effect on reducing um, carbon footprint and overall emissions? Again, it's something that's in the early stage of shims. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, again, there's research ongoing in Johnson Castle. Uh, it's early days yet. Uh, the results aren't actually out yet at the minute, but um, if it could reduce the, the uh, it's, it's ammonia is probably where it's going to reduce the emissions on, on that side of it. And we have a separate target ammonia, which probably is going to be as hard to achieve as the, the greenhouse gas emission target. Uh, so it's early stages yet at the minute in relation to, to, to um, story editors. Yeah, and Shibis, you may have addressed this, but this question has come up and perhaps others are asking as well. Extra days of grass, what's the value to extra days of grass in terms of reducing emissions? Uh, every extra week of grass can reduce the emissions at farm level by 1% overall. Uh, and put into context, I think it's worth about €2.70 per cow for dairy cow. Uh, it's probably about half that for dry stock operations. Okay. 
And Eleanor, back to you, there's a question here on the usage of electricity. This person is using um, windmill and solar energy um, mostly, and is this taken into account? Um, so the sustainability survey is being, a new version of it is being, re, is being launched uh, next month, and we will be giving farmers the opportunity to record their energy use, as well as um, if they've got uh, solar or solar power for water or solar PV for electricity or wind for electricity installed. So with those three, we'll be able to incorporate energy reduction because of the use of renewable into the carbon footprint, hopefully next year. So. Okay. Tom, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just going to say that we're joined by Jack. Uh, the technical difficulties have been resolved. So you're very welcome, Jack. Yeah, I put on the short now. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I'm very conscious of the time and that we're yeah. at, at um, 8.30. So um, yeah. I might leave the question. No, that, that, that's good. I, I just like to comment on, on maybe two, um, a question and a comment that I've noticed in the chat, Siobhan, if that's okay. Yeah, we're correct. Um, you know, there's a question re relating to whether there are signpost suckler farmers, and most definitely there are. There are 22 uh, signpost suckler demonstration farmers uh, across the country. There are also eight sheep uh, signpost demonstration farmers, and uh, there's 12 calf to beef uh, signpost demonstration farmers. So just for tonight's webinar, we've uh, involved uh, one of our dairy signpost farmers, Jack Carney, and we're, we're very grateful for that. But just just to reflect um, a comment or a question that I saw in the... Um, and also tillage in, farms, Tom. And sorry, all, yes, of course, James, also tillage farms. And, you know, we, we will have more Steinpost programme webinars and we, we will address issues that are perhaps more, more even more relevant to um, those other enterprises. Um, and I suppose the other, you know, the other um, comment is that, you know, in Seamus's presentation, he did touch on the fact that uh, on, on suckler and sheep farms and dry stock farms, the overall emissions are going to be lower. That's, that's recognized. So the scope for reducing emissions through, say, switching to protected urea and perhaps you know, um, improving soil fertility so as to reduce fertilizer usage, the scope for that is less, uh, is reduced, should I say. Yes, there's, there's no hiding that. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not, um, we're not denying that. Nonetheless, the, the important point to uh, maybe keep in mind is that every farmer can play a part in reducing emissions. That's 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 what 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 what's the important thing to remember. I think. Um, okay. So I just wanted to make um, a comment on that uh, on on just two of the the questions and comments I noticed in the chat. Tom, so, can I just ask one final question? It's just one has come in there in the last okay. few minutes. Does Eleanor think Board B will link with pasture-based users um, eventually, so to gather the information from pasture-based directly? Yeah, so actually this year we've we've done a lot of work with integrating with uh, the ICBF uh, systems and part of our ambition working with ICBF and Chagask will be to link up with um, pasture base and, and ultimately some of the, the farm applications out there, you know, to, to try and take the burden of that data recording from the farmers away. So, yeah, we, we do intend and, and we're, we, we, we hope to get out to that um, and start thinking about it next year anyway. Thanks, okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, it's it, it my duty now to thank uh, our panelists this evening. So, I'd like to thank uh, Eleanor Murphy of Board Bia, Seamus you. Kearney of Chagas, uh, Jack Kearney, uh, County Cork Dairy Farmer, and uh, my colleague in Chagas, Siobhan Cavanagh. Also, on um, our technical assistant this evening, um, I hope you'll forgive me maybe for describing him as that, but uh, he's uh, got us all. Um, uh, up and running and uh, has kept the broadcast going has been Porik Foley. So thanks, Porik. Uh, he's been working hard off camera. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Yvonne Marr as well, who um, looked after uh, registrations and uh, getting this event set up. So um, thanks to the panelists. Uh, and also my, my final duty then is to thank you, the audience, for uh, joining us in such large numbers. For the large number of questions that you submitted, um, I, I think we did a we, we made a fair job of getting through as many questions as we, we could have in, in the time we had. Um, any questions that are not answered, we'll, we'll attempt to answer uh, in the coming days and uh, we, we'll post answers um, to those that have, um, I think, opted to receive emails. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.